send it to you. I may have to send it uh, via Dropbox or something. I do anticipate it will be a fairly large file. Um, I can also send you the PowerPoint presentation um, that we will be showing. So today, um, we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, my name is Hillary Hartley. I am the Program Officer for Spain, Portugal, Mexico, and Nicaragua here at ISEP. Today's participants will be Linda Stewart, who's the Director of Iberian and Latin American Programs. We refer to our region as IBLA for Iberia and Latin America, so if you hear that, that's why. And also joining us today is Regina Harple, who's our Program Officer for Latin America. Today we'll be covering um, five main things broader trends and observations, language requirements, how placement decisions are made. We'll go over each country and university. Um, due to time restraints, we do have 31 universities. In just an hour and a half, we're going to be highlighting sections of each university. Um, but if you do have questions at any point, please feel free to enter them in the chat box, which is located right here. You can send um, messages to the entire audience or just the organizer specifically, um, and we'll go through it that way. There is a question and answer section after each main section that you'll have the opportunity to ask for questions or clarifications before we move on. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Linda Stewart, who's our director, and she will be going over some broader trends and observations. Uh, welcome, good morning, thank you all for participating uh, in this webinar. Uh, we hope it will be very informative. Like Hillary said, I'm the director of the IBLA team. I'm also director of the GEP Costa Rica program. Uh, to begin with, uh, I would like to uh, say that the webinars are a new initiative and uh, we have followed the one given by the Asia Pacific team and uh, hope that we will have uh, other ones in the future, not only our team, but those of the other regional teams at ISEP. Uh, one of the uh, newest things that we have to announce is our great new marketing team. Uh, in addition to the director, we now have two additional staff members completely devoted to publication and social media, which has just been launched. As you can see, this is our uh, ISEP uh, page and uh, on Facebook. So uh, what we would ask you is please uh, to friend us and join our group. It has close to 9,000 members. You can also tweet us at, at ISEP Study Abroad. And you can follow all our pins on Pinterest. You can also check our photos on Instagram and read our blog. Please join us in these activities. The next thing I would like to discuss are the new programs that are offered in the region. As you know, we're always aware of the special or specific demands of the coordinators and students, and we do try to meet them as much as possible. One of our very new program is the Summer Green Adventure Program in Nicaragua, offered all in English. Then we have the Summer Program in Costa Rica, which has now become a GEP program, and Regina will discuss, uh, go into a little more depth on, on that program later on. There's the year-long option of Guanajuato for language learners, and this is at all levels. There's uh, a new program at FAAPI that will be coming on, all in English as well. Uh, Regina will be uh, discussing that later on. And there's the UPAYET pre-med program, which uh, Hillary will be going into depth on in her uh, presentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are always aware of, or try to be aware of what your and your student specific uh, demands are and needs are. And so what we're concentrating uh, on right now is opening new program avenues to sophomores, uh, beginning language students, and the courses in English. With these courses in English, what we're hoping for is a combination of courses in English 
with host language program. I will be passing this uh, meeting on to Hillary. To Regina. Yeah, to Regina. I'm so sorry. I'm passing this on to Regina Harpo. Uh, um, and she will be with you to discuss meeting language requirements, among other things. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Regina Harpo. I'm the program officer for Latin America, and I handle Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, and Uruguay. Um, so I'll be speaking a little bit about language requirements. Meeting language requirements at the host university is key. So remember, though, that the host has the final say about entrance requirements. Occasionally, students who have the required number of semesters cannot be placed or confirmed due to low language level. Our main concern with language is that students are able to follow lectures, read materials, and understand course content. Remember that in most cases, these are not Spanish conversation classes, but rather courses taught in Spanish. An example would be marketing in Spanish. And here on the screen, you'll see a screenshot of part of a language proficiency report, which is filled out by a language instructor. He or she must rate the student on four different categories, on listening, writing, speaking, and reading. The instructor also notes whether or not the student may need additional training. And we do take this uh, language proficiency report seriously when we are considering applications. And Hillary will talk about that more in a minute, too. But as far as language levels are concerned, the beginner level is what we tend to consider um, when a student has between zero to two or three semesters of Spanish. Intermediate low to the intermediate level is when they have two to three or four to, five, two, four to five university level semesters of Spanish. The intermediate level to intermediate high is when they have four or five to six plus semesters of Spanish. And lastly, advanced is when they have six plus semesters of Spanish. Um, another thing we'd like to point out is that pre-session language courses or pre-session language sessions and intensive language courses are wonderful resources for students who may need that additional training. Availability depends by site and is indicated in the language notes section of the directory pages and also can be found in the student's IIS. And now I'll pass this on to Hillary so she can talk about how to make placement decisions or how we make placement yeah. decisions. <laughs> Thanks, Regina. Um, I think one of the key things is about this webinar that we'd like to impart to you is how we, as a team, make placement decisions. We're a little bit different from some of the other regions in that we have a lot of programs where courses are going to be taught entirely in the host language, although we do have English language options as well that we'll be highlighting. So the things um, we would like you to take away is from this webinar is the background of our universities and countries but also how we make our placement decisions and the things that we consider in making those decisions. So overall, the things we will consider are the host site request list. We do always try to place students in their top choices, but as Regina mentioned, our primary concern is making sure that the student has a good fit with the university they'll be placed at. We will ensure that the student has sufficient academic and linguistic preparation before placing a student. Going on a little bit more about the language level, the language level is something that we will consider and weigh heavily when making a placement decision. We take into account the language proficiency report as well as the personal statement when making this determination. As Regina stated, we do take professor's feedback in the language proficiency report quite seriously. Um, if they say that students are at a certain level, we expect students to be at that level. And if they comment that additional language training is need or if the placement is conditioned for any reason, we will consider that when placing them. The personal statement is very important as well. It's really the only way that we get to see a student's written level of Spanish. And one of the coordinators asked before we started this webinar, if students who are at a very intermediate or elementary level, let's say a beginner with just maybe one to two semesters of Spanish, or for our friends in Europe at the A1, A2 level, if they need to submit uh, a written statement in Spanish. I would say generally that any student that has at least a semester of university level uh, credit that appears on a transcript should submit at least a short written statement in Spanish. It, it obviously won't be um, to the level of sophistication as an advanced student, but we do want to see 
where they are in reading in writing, and uh, many times coordinators will not confirm a student if they see University Spanish credit on a transcript and it is not accompanied by a personal statement. Any student that's applying for a site where there's no Spanish required at all does not have to submit a Spanish uh, personal statement, but any student with at least one semester should submit one, but of course we'll expect it to be much more elementary in nature. We will check their personal statement against their language proficiency report. Again, if that student's only had one to two semesters of Spanish, but is writing at a much more advanced level, we may question either the LPR or whether or not the student really wrote that. The personal statement needs to be a reflection of their work, not of their friends that happens to be a native speaker, and certainly not of Google Translate. Uh, the personal statement is very important because of the amount of writing required at Latin American and Spanish universities when students will be attending regular university uh, courses taught in Spanish. One note on language, while we are talking about language level, there is a difference between native speakers and heritage speakers. Native speakers of Spanish generally grew up in a Spanish-speaking country and received formal education in the language. Heritage speakers, on the other hand, grew up with one or more Spanish-speaking parents in the house, but probably did not receive formal instruction in writing and reading. Generally, these students will score higher on listening and speaking and lower in writing and reading. And our coordinators may occasionally suggest that heritage speakers take additional grammar instruction before going abroad. This isn't meant to slight the students but so that they're accurately prepared because these students will be expected to perform at a high level. The course request list is something that we also take quite seriously. We need detailed information with the full name of the course students would like to take at the university, not just Spanish or the equivalent of Spanish 102 at the University of Iowa. We want to know that the student has looked and made sure that this is an appropriate place for students to go. Um, if a course request list isn't filled out completely, it will delay the placement process, and we will go back to you and ask for more information. Uh, many coordinators will actually verify to see if courses are available or suggest alternate courses based off of the course request list. So we ask that you double check that these do, um, you know, are filled out correctly. Navigating websites can be a little challenging, especially if you as a coordinator maybe don't speak Spanish, and we are happy to help you with that. On the ISEP directory pages, on the academics tab, there's a section called Hints for Researching Courses with detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how you can go about finding courses and help your students. If you're still having trouble, though, please call us. We've done this many times, and we'll be happy to walk you through the process. The coordinator statement on the second page of the application is also key. We want to know about students' maturity and preparedness. If you are nominating multiple students for the same site, we also ask that you please rank the students because that's helpful in us making uh, placement decisions. Students, of course, will submit two academic references from university-level professors or their academic advisors. We do consider GPA. Uh, it needs to be a minimum 2.75, but it isn't the only factor we look at. If a student has had a bad semester, they are welcome to submit a letter explaining what happened and what they're doing to actively remedy the situation. We do have a few universities that will accept students with a GPA below a 2.75, but before submitting those students for consideration, we ask that you please check with Regina or I first. There is one university in our region that requires a higher GPA than a 2.75, and I will point that out later. In the case of a competitive site, meaning generally the sites that have limited or very limited chances of placement, there are a couple other things we consider. We try to dole out exchange space fairly. We always consider academic merit first, but we try not to award too many exchange spaces to the same university when chances of placement are limited or very limited. So if you see that that is the chance of placement at that university, please don't nominate more than one student per university. 
Um, applications submitted after the priority deadline for places where the chances of placement are fair, limited, or very limited don't have a very good uh, chance of being considered after that priority deadline, so make sure they're on time. There are sites that will accept uh, applications after the priority deadline, but please check our website to see which sites are still open. ICEP Direct sites tend to have a later deadline as well. Finally, the site-specific statement on a course request list will help us make those difficult decisions. Um, academic reasons are appropriate. Personal reasons are not. An example would be a student interested in studying architecture in Spain may list that they want to go to the University of Malaga because it's only one of two schools in Spain that offer architecture. That would be an appropriate academic reason that showed me that the student has done their homework. Saying that they want to go to Malaga because it's close to a beach is a valid personal reason, but not a valid academic reason. And that's what we're primarily concerned with um, in the site-specific course request list. Um, OK, so moving on, today what we're going to be talking about, we've broken our region into three sections, the Iberian Peninsula, which will include Spain and Portugal, Central America and the Caribbean, which will include Costa Rica, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Puerto Rico. And then South America, which will include Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Uruguay. We will take a break between each section and make sure that we've answered any of your questions. And the first one is here now. So does anyone have any uh, questions or anything they'd like to clarify at this point? Remember, you can enter your questions into the chat function of our um, webinar here. Okay, I'm going to wait just a moment. Okay, uh, all right, so Tammy has asked, what about personal reasons beyond, I like the beach. We had a student whose sister was married to a Swedish citizen and had lived there for years. It was important to him to spend a semester in Sweden. That would be something that, you know, we would appreciate knowing. Um, we will certainly consider that. Um, but again, we do try to make our primary, our primary concern is in an appropriate academic placement. But if a student does have uh, heritage ties or family ties, we will take those into consideration. That is a little bit uh, more of a reasonable request than just being near the beach. So um, I would also recommend in the case like that where it's you know, very specific, um, you may want to talk to us ahead of time, and we can recommend some sites that might have better chances of placement that your student can also consider. OK, moving on. If you do have questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to enter them. We will try and address your questions as we go through the webinar. So first, we're going to start off with our, our sites in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, we do have nine in Spain and one in Portugal, and I think a map is sometimes helpful in seeing where our sites are located. There is a map on our website. Um, it's available from most of the directory pages. First, we're going to be discussing our member in Portugal, which is Universidad de Lusófona de Humanidades y Tecnologías. We have two sites in Galicia, Universidad de Vigo, which has two campuses. A little bit further to the north, we have Universidad Santiago de Compostela. In Pamplona, we have Universidad Pública de Navarra. In Madrid, we have two sites, Universidad Alfonso X el Sabio, which is located just outside of Madrid. We have Universidad Complutense de Madrid, which is located in the heart of the city. In the Balearic Islands, we have Universidad de las Islas Baleares. In Andalusia, we have two universities, Universidad de Málaga and Universidad de Almería. And in the community of Murcia, we have Universidad de Murcia. So moving on to Portugal, um, this is what a lot of the coastline in Portugal looks like. Our university is located in Lisbon, which is a beautiful city. It's one of the oldest cities in Western Europe and one of the oldest cities in the world. This university has a focus on both humanities and technology. Um, really interesting, unique coursework available on Africa and the Portuguese diaspora. Uh, students don't have to speak Portuguese to go to this site. Uh, this is true of both our university in Brazil and in uh, Portugal. 
students who have a uh, any who meet any of these three language requirements may apply. A minimum of four semesters of university level Portuguese, a combined minimum of four semesters of Portuguese and Spanish, and intermediate to advanced Spanish speakers with five or more semesters of university level Spanish or the equivalent may also apply. Students will then take sort of a crash course uh, explaining the differences between Portuguese and Spanish for two weeks before the program begins. And then during the semester, they will have the opportunity to participate in intensive Portuguese language courses. I do want to take this opportunity to point out that we always say so-and-so semesters of Spanish or Portuguese or the equivalent. If a student has tested out of the first three semesters of Spanish and is taking the equivalent of the fourth semester, we will consider them to be taking their four semesters of Spanish. It doesn't necessarily have to be on their transcript. We do count the ones that they have tested out of or maybe completed via an AP test in high school. OK, moving on to Spain. Uh, generally, our programs are for intermediate to advanced level students, except during the summer, where we have a summer program open to beginners. We do have two programs I'd like to highlight, the bridge program at Universidad Pública de Navarra. It's a pre-session offered in August and in uh, January. It's open to any ISEP student that might need a uh, brush up on their Spanish before they move on to an ISEP exchange program. We do have one language and culture program offered at the University of Murcia, which we'll talk about in detail. Uh, Spanish student visas can be confusing. Um, students really need to review the country handbook carefully. For the full year students that are applying to from the US to go to Spain, they will have to get either a state level or FBI background check as part of their visas. And I will prompt you as coordinators to remind them of that, um, usually in March or April. The academic calendar in Spain is a little bit different, um, with two exceptions. Most students will not be back in time for the spring semester in the US. Um, occasionally, at certain sites, students can arrange for early exams, but that's nothing that we can guarantee in advance. So starting with our first university in Galicia, it's the University of Vigo. There are two campuses, one in Vigo and one in Pontevedra. The majority of students will go to the Vigo campus, which is phenomenal for Spanish or business. But there is a second campus located 30 minutes, more or less, by train or bus from Vigo that hosts arts, communication, and physiotherapy classes. Uh, this is the first exception to the Spanish academic calendar rule. Students can uh, come back in time for their second US semester as courses end in late December. Um, Galicia is one of the provinces of Spain that has two official languages, Gallego and Spanish. But at this university, the vast majority of courses are taught in Spanish. It is important to note that students can take courses at our campus, but not both. Uh, students don't necessarily think of Vigo when they're thinking of the beach, but the university is actually located uh, pretty close to the beach. Um, I know that's something that we said you know, is sort of a superficial reason to have them applying. but if your student is interested in marine science or marine biology, this is a great location for them. There's a national, a Spanish national marine biology lab located there. And your students who happen to be there in the summer months or, or late spring would really enjoy it. It's a modern campus located outside the city, and students will live in the city center. Moving on to Universidad de Santiago de Compostela in Galicia, unlike um, our University in Vigo, about 40% of courses are taught in Gallego here, but students are able to find enough courses in Spanish. This is another site that's very good for communication and Spanish language. Um, Gallego is very similar to Spanish, but it is a distinct language. Most of the time, if you see it written, you can catch on fairly easily. And it would be unusual for students to find someone that did not speak Spanish and only Gallego, especially in the larger towns and cities. It is best for independent-minded, mature students. Um, and I would recommend junior standing at this campus. It uh, is located in one of the historic towns of 
Spain is the end of the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela. This is the residence hall that students will live in in the upper left-hand corner. Um, it's a really, it's a newer residence hall built in the 80s, and students receive a generous meal stipend, which they can use to cook or eat out. Uh, moving a little bit further east to Universidad Pública de Navarra, uh, which is located in Pamplona, known for the running of the bulls. Hopefully your students won't know it for that, though, because that's done in July, and students are normally done by then. There are two ICEP exchange, uh, options there, ICEP Exchange and ICEP Direct Bridge Program. It's a medium-sized city, but it's very well connected to the rest of Spain uh, via public transport. Uh, I do want to point out, again, this is the public university, not the private University of Navarra. Uh, our students sometimes get the two confused, and they do have a pretty distinct course offering. There are some classes in English offered at the university, uh, the public university of Navarra, mainly in engineering, business, and economics, and your students are welcome to enroll in those courses. So the first option that Universidad Pública de Navarra offers is the ICEP Direct Bridge Program. And this is available to any ICEP student who would like to take additional language training before they go. It's an intensive program, three weeks with 90 instructional hours, 75 in the classroom, and 15 in a supervised language laboratory. This is good for students that may not have the appropriate language level to begin their ICEP exchange program immediately, or for those students who may need uh, some help in making the transition to Spanish academic life. I would really recommend this program to sophomores who are going to go on and complete an ICEP exchange. It sort of does really help them acclimate to Spanish academic life. Uh, this program only includes tuition and housing, as we found the least expensive way to offer this program was that students cook their own meals. Again, students can complete this program and then go on to any of our universities in Spain, uh, and it's offered in both August and in January. The ICEP exchange program at Publica de Navarra is best for business, sociology, and engineering majors. I don't recommend this site for Spanish majors because there is not a Spanish department, and students do need to keep that in mind when applying. Again, this is a good site for students that may need a little bit more support, and it only requires five semesters of Spanish to participate in the ICEP exchange. Okay. Students apply for the ICEP Direct Bridge Program with this few okay. um, semesters of Spanish. Um, so anyone who is interested in participating in the Direct Bridge Program, again, needs three semesters of Spanish before they start. They will gain the equivalent of two additional university semesters. Normally, 90 instructional hours transfers back to about six U.S. units. Moving a little south to the community of Madrid, uh, I want to talk about Alfonso X Sabio, which is our private university located in Villanueva La Cañada, which is a university town located 45 minutes outside of Madrid. It's a new university built in 1997. It's good for sophomores and students who do need a little bit of extra support. Um, it's an American-style campus. Everything's in the same place. There is an international office with that is well staffed, um, and there is good attention to student services at this site. I would recommend this site for students who are interested in languages and business. There is uh, very much of an emphasis in the entrepreneurial spirit at this university, and there are some internship possibilities once students arrive. Generally, for students looking to do internships in Spain, it's important to keep in mind that students with advanced Spanish will be at an advantage in doing this, and that they're generally secured once students arrive on campus. Um, this is one of two sites in Spain that does not accept students on the international to international program, and the other one being our next university, which is Complutense de Madrid. Complutense de Madrid is different from Alfonso de Simón Sabio in that it's a huge public urban university. Uh, students need to list this as their very first choice if they want to be considered. Due to the academic rigor at this institution, we require a 3.5 GPA to apply and junior standing. Advanced level of Spanish is recommended, I would say, six 
to seven semesters. We only require six, but students do need to be very advanced here. Um, again, because it's such a large institution, over 80,000 students, students will need to be mature and ready to integrate into regular university life. It is located in the Ciudad Universitaria neighborhood of Madrid, which is well connected to the rest of Madrid by public transportation. Uh, it does offer everything from Slavic languages to engineering to fine arts, so it is a very comprehensive university. Because it's considered to be the best university in Spain and one of the best universities in the world, students do know uh, Complutense by name. And to give you an idea, um, generally when I have two spaces available, I will have anywhere from 15 to 25 students requesting those two spaces. So that's why the chances of placement are so limited. Um, I would recommend that students list alternate options when applying for Complutense because of how competitive it can be. Due to the economic crisis uh, out in Spain, Complutense has been closed for a few semesters, but generally um, there are openings in the spring. For fall and full year applicants, it is closed for this semester. Moving south to Andalusia, Universidad de Malaga is one of our two sites. In Andalusia, there are two campuses, one located downtown and the major campus located just outside, uh, which is connected both by metro or bus. This is a popular site, so students should list it in their top few choices. Um, I would say junior standing is preferred, but not absolutely required. And full year placements are also preferred, but not required. As I mentioned earlier, it's one of two sites offering architecture the other being Alfonso de Simón Sabio. Malaga is a very old city with a great deal of history. This is a great site for history, social science majors, or Spanish language. Um, here we have a picture of the Alcazaba, which is a fortress. Uh, you can't see over here, but it directly overlooks the sea. And then a Roman amphitheater that they found that dates to the first, semester, or the first uh, century before the Common Era that they just happened to find when they were looking to build an apartment building. So there's a lot of history there. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two campuses. The main campus, Teatino, which we see here, is located just outside the city. Students will live on the Teatino campus in a residence hall. Uh, there are more photos of the residence hall available that I will send out. They have a very large sports complex um, where students can participate in gym classes or just go to the gym on their own and they even offer scuba diving classes. Our other university in Almeria is, or in Andalusia is Universidad de Almeria. It is a very popular site as well. The chances of placement here are a little bit better. They're generally good. I would recommend that students list it in their top few choices in order to be considered. Um, there are courses in English available. They are instituting what they call a plural linguism program with courses offered in languages other than Spanish. They offer courses in English, uh, a few generally in French and German, and every now and then one in Portuguese and one in Italian. Generally, these courses are in business, economics, and psychology, as well as in agricultural engineering, which Almeria is one of the better schools in Spain for. Students with four plus semesters can apply for this program, but they still need to have an intermediate level of Spanish to participate. Students with just four semesters of Spanish will take classes in English as well as Spanish as a second language and maybe one to two courses in Spanish, regular university courses in Spanish. Um, again, if your students are not at an intermediate level but have four semesters of Spanish, we may require them to take additional language training or participate in the bridge program before they go to the University of Almeria. Uh, students with six plus semesters in Spanish are welcome to enroll in regular university courses. Again, they need to be at the intermediate advanced level to do that. The university is located across the street from the beach, as we can see here. Uh, this is the university, and this fuzzy blue stuff over here is the water. We do offer a summer program on ISEP Direct at the University of Almeria. It's open to beginner, intermediate, and advanced level students. We do ask the students to have some background in Spanish. Um, generally, two semesters of university level Spanish, three semesters, or excuse me, or three years of high school Spanish, 
If your student only has one semester of university level Spanish, we may be able to make an exception, but please contact me first before having the student apply. Students participate in this month-long program and earn 12 ECTS credits for two required courses, and they have the option to choose between three elective courses. Um, excursions and outings are included in the academic program, uh, such as an overnight excursion to the Alhambra, trips to the Cabo de Gata uh, National Park, and the uh, Civil War refuges that are located in Almeria, which are really interesting. Moving further east to the University of Murcia, which is located in the community of Murcia, we have four program options available to students. And for those of you who are ISF Direct members out here, out there, uh, Murcia is, other than uh, the Bridge program, the only semester or full year program that we offer in Spain. And I'll go through these options briefly. This, there is a very supportive coordinator there who is a member of our Council of Advisors. It is a very popular site with a lot of students applying, but generally chances of placement are good because they also send out a great deal of students. Students should still list this among their top choices in order to be considered. The first two options are the same academic curriculum, but they're just offered on ISEP Exchange or ISEP Direct. So those of you out there who are ISEP Direct members would be welcome to send students on this program. It's the exact same program as our ISEP exchange program, but just another option for your students to go. This is for students with six plus semesters of Spanish. Uh, Mercia does ask for an intermediate high to advanced level. There is a pre-session language program that's included in ISEP benefits as well. The third and fourth options at the University of Mercia are ISEP direct language and culture program, which are offered um, for either a semester or a full year. The direct language and culture program can be a standalone semester. If it is, in this case, students who go for the fall will be back in time for the spring semester. And those students who'd like to participate in option four, which is our full year program, can do language and culture first semester and take regular courses second semester. Uh, students who do this option occasionally ask to do the ISEP direct language and culture program uh, first semester on direct and go on exchange in second semester, uh, which is a possibility, but it is two separate programs and ISET benefits are not included between the two programs. There would be about a six week gap there. Uh, only four semesters of Spanish are needed to apply for the ISET direct language and culture program. Our final site in Spain is Universitat de los Ilos Barreares, which is located in Palma de Mallorca in the Balearic Islands. It is a multi-campus institution, but students can only go to the Palma de Mallorca campus. Uh, the Menorca and Ibiza campuses are closed to ISEP students. This is a site that requires advanced level Spanish because there are two languages of instruction, Spanish and Catalan. Unlike Gallego, Catalan is pretty different from Spanish and can be difficult to understand. So we do not recommend that students take regular university courses in Catalan and instead ensure that they're taking courses taught in Spanish. Um, because Palma de Mallorca is a major tourist destination, this is a wonderful site for students interested in tourism and business. Our ISEP coordinator in the past has been able to help students locate internships there, but they should indicate that they're interested in this on their ISEP application. It can be competitive, so we ask that students um, list it in their top choices. And this is a site that's best for Mature students, we do recommend junior standing in this case, but it isn't absolutely required. So at this point, I'd like to pause and see if there are any questions about our programs in the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. At this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Regina to talk about Costa Rica. She and I share responsibilities in Central America and the Caribbean, so I'll be back in just a moment. Okay. 
Okay, great. So to start us off with Central America, uh, I'll start with Costa Rica. And for my site, what I did is I just had a slide for some examples of some activities or adventures that students might do on their own. For Costa Rica, some of those things that I list on the PowerPoint slide are some things that they will do actually as part of the program. But for my other sites, they're just things in general that students can do on their own if students are ever asking you, oh, well, what is there to do in country X, Y, Z? Um, those are just some ideas. And in this slide, you'll see the, at the bottom left-hand corner, that's a picture of the Arena Volcano. And the top right picture is a student from this past semester um, during the week-long community service program. During this program, students do a different or a variety of different volunteer projects, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, but in this picture, the student helped decorate a community children's pool with ceramic tiles as one of uh, her projects. Um, and all the programs in Costa Rica are global engagement programs. You might be asking yourself, well, what is a GEP? You might have heard the term being tossed around before. You might have heard it here and there. But you still might not be quite certain what entails a GEP and, and what exactly it means. A GEP stands for Global Engagement Program. And the GEPs focus on volunteer work, community service, things of that nature. And all global engagement programs include community engagement opportunities. They also include an on-site resident director, excursions, and a language, a language course all under ISET benefits. Um, one new thing that I wanted to point out to you guys is that our summer program in Costa Rica is now officially considered a GEP. It includes a week-long community service program. Um, so this is a great opportunity for those who maybe can't go for the semester but do want a combination of you know, Spanish, a language, and culture plus community service. And they will get a uh, certificate of participation at the end of the program, which will be sent to the student's home coordinator. So here is a map of Costa Rica. And here you'll see where Universidad Nacional is located. It is located about an hour away from San Jose. OK, so all of our programs are located at the Universidad Nacional in Heredia, as I just mentioned. And one thing I want to point out is that Exchange Space is very, very competitive um, at the Universidad Nacional, or UNA. Um, I would like to point out that it is a great option for sophomores. For one thing, they only require four semesters of Spanish. And since it is a GEP, we do have a resident director who is very involved and very supportive. So this is a great option for students either with a lower Spanish level or students who might need a little extra support. Um, as it is GEP, ICEP Central is also more involved. I frequently am in contact with the students. I also started a GEP Facebook group, which they use to communicate with each other. And I chime in occasionally as well. Um, and so far, the Facebook group has been very successful. Students have been able to interact with past students and kind of get their opinions on how things went or, or ask them any questions they might have had. Um, I do also want to point out that for Costa Rica, due to space limitations with courses, students do have to follow the specific course registration instructions um, when filling out their course request list as part of the ISEP application. I do have a link to the course request, or excuse me, course registration instructions on the UNA directory page. So please be sure to have them follow those instructions when completing their course request list. If I get an application and I see that maybe they didn't follow that director exactly, then I'll contact the coordinator and ask that the student submit a new course request list for UNA. And lastly, I just wanted to kind of go into a little bit more detail about the week-long community service program. Um, during this week-long community service program, students are taken off-site and do an array of volunteer activities which may include anything from working on family coffee plantations to teaching English, amongst other opportunities. Um, and we also do have volunteer opportunities throughout the semester as well. So students are always more than welcome to contact the resident director to find out what those opportunities are. And she can help the students uh, find something to do if they want to do extra volunteer work. And as I mentioned, the students will receive a certificate of participation at the end of the program. Okay, so we're going to switch back to me. Uh, this is Hillary again. I know that Mexico is technically in North America, but we had to sort of group it in with Central America and the Caribbean so that we could talk about this in, in, within the region. 
Um, I do want to point out that in Mexico, all of our seven sites are open on ISIP Exchange um, and all have excellent chances of placement. We do remain in constant contact with our coordinators on the ground regarding the security situation. Um, the U.S. Department of State has issued a travel advice warning um, for certain sections of Mexico, but other sections of Mexico um, don't have an active travel advisory in effect, and several of our sites are located in these uh, locations. Um, one way to think about the travel warning, too, up in, in the country is if something is happening in, say, um, Detroit, it doesn't necessarily mean that you in California or you and even other parts of Michigan are affected by what's happening in Detroit. So it is important to think about the travel warning in its context. Um, that said, Mexico is an excellent site for language learners. Many of our programs don't require any prior knowledge of Spanish and offer a number of courses in English. Um, especially, a lot of these courses are designed so that local Mexican students can enroll in them as well to improve their English language abilities. Uh, some are designed for international students, um, but they are really concerned about making sure that students are integrating into local Mexican uh, university life as well. So we, like I mentioned before, we have seven members, three that are located in Monterey, uh, Tech de Monterey. The Monterey campus is the only campus that we send students to. Universidad de Monterey and Universidad Regio Montana are all located in the greater Monterey metropolitan area. We have a site in just outside of Guadalajara. Itesto is located in Tlaquepaque. The University of Guanajuato is located. The Guanajuato campus only. There are multiple campuses. Universidad La Salle in Mexico City. And of course, Upayap in Puebla. So to start in Monterey, we do have three member universities. All of them have lower language requirements, classes in English volunteer and service learning opportunities. There are also some excellent internship opportunities in Monterey because of the number of multinational corporations that have their Latin American or Mexican headquarters in Monterey. The internship opportunities for students are phenomenal there. Um, again, as you can see here, the famous, uh, I think they call this the saddle, um, uh, the Monterey mountain chain. And it is a really pretty place to be. Our first university that we're going to talk about in Monterey is Universidad Regio Montana. It does operate on a trimester calendar, but your students can get a full semester worth of courses done. This is good for students who need to arrive a little later or depart a little earlier because of summer plans. Uh, it's a great site for sophomores. The ISEP coordinator is a former ISEP student. Uh, URUERE, as they call it, is a university with a great entrepreneurial uh, spirit. It's a great site for tourism, hospitality, and business management. They have laboratories that are set up like hotel rooms so students can get sort of a real feel about what a hotel room or hotel lobby should look like when people are arriving. They also have a lab dedicated to Mexican gastronomy. Um, and students have a couple of different housing options. Uh, Regio Montana does offer some courses in English, um, generally in business administration, um, but your students can also take Spanish as a second language or regular university courses in Spanish. Universidad de Monterrey, or UDEM as we call them, is located in San Pedro Garza Garcia, which is one of five cities that make up the greater metropolitan area of Monterrey. Um, San Pedro Garza Garcia is considered to be one of the most expensive zip codes in all of Mexico. It's a very nice neighborhood. It's a private university, um, no previous Spanish required. Students can go as absolute beginners and take classes in English and Spanish as a second language. They do have a service learning program, um, and students can live on or off campus depending on what they prefer. Uh, students who are education majors in the past have gone and done classroom observations. Pre-med students have been able to observe medical doctors. Uh, so there are a couple of different interesting internship opportunities available. We do have an ISEP Direct Summer Service Learning Program available at UDEM that spends half the time in Monterey and half the time in Merida on the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, these are the residence halls. They're brand new, and they're far nicer than most university residence halls I've stayed in in college. So some great options there as well. Our third campus in Monterey is the Tecnológico de Monterey, also known as the TESM. The Tech is one of the most prestigious schools in all of North America. There is 
as the name would say, a technological focus, but it is great for students interested in social sciences and humanities. This university offers over 200 courses in English each semester, and a lot of these courses are with local Mexican students, not necessarily just international students. Um, it is a closed campus. You have to have an ID card to get on campus. And because it's a closed campus, there are a couple of extra students, including deer, geese, peacocks, and cats um, that somehow found their way in, and they're now part of the tech family. Um, they have very modern installations. They have an amazingly huge gym with Zumba classes, a nice school, um, great internship opportunities. The campus is very internationalized. Uh, lots of ICEP coordinators uh, support it. Do either of the Monterey universities offer courses in translation at the grad level? Um, that is something I'm going to have to look into. I do know that UDEM is open to students at the graduate level, but I'll have to take a look at that and get back to you. Okay. Moving a little further south into the center is Universidad de Guanajuato. We have two options, regular university courses in Spanish, or Spanish as a second language. I'll talk about that program, which is new in just a moment. Uh, this is a great site for students that are interested in teaching either Spanish or who want to be uh, teaching, uh, teaching English as a second language. They have a bachelor's degree in TEFL. Um, your students are welcome to apply to this program. It's one of the few options on ICEP Exchange that's open. So students at Universidad de Guanajuato have a new option available to them. Uh, students without any prior knowledge of Spanish can go for a full year and take full-time Spanish language and Mexican culture uh, and history study in semester one, and then transition to regular university courses in semester two. So this program is really open to anyone between zero semesters of Spanish up to four semesters of Spanish. Um, if your student has four semesters more or more Spanish, they can just take regular university courses. Um, but this is a great option for your students that may need a little bit of a, a way to enter into regular academic life in Mexico. Um, the coordinators there do want to make sure that your students are integrated into campus life in the second semester. So the students should be prepared to uh, get ready and integrate into regular university courses. The coordinators there will advise which courses would be appropriate for students in the second semester at an intermediate language level. Uh, syllabi and course descriptions for this program are available on our website, and I invite you to take a look at that when you do have a chance. Um, Guanajuato, the entire town, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so this is a great site for students who are interested in history and social sciences. Moving on to our site, which is located just out of Guadalajara in Tlaquepaque. Um, I have a question from Tammy. Can students do just the first semester of this intensive program? At the moment, um, no, it is only available on a full year option. Um, but most of our other universities, with the exception of um, Universidad La Salle, students can do intensive Spanish as a second language and courses in English just for a semester. But at, uh, at Guanajuato and La Salle, this is not an option for just a semester. Okay, so ITESA, which is located in Tilaquipaque, just outside of Guadalajara, is uh, in Mexico's second largest city. Through the 3 plus 1 program, students can take classes in English and intensive Spanish as a second language. Uh, the Spanish as a second language is between 6 and 8 U.S. credits. It is very intensive, meeting 6 to 8 hours a week. There are volunteer opportunities available through the Ignatian Center on campus. Uh, no previous Spanish is required to apply. Uh, different housing options available. Uh, I did want to take this opportunity to point out this is an entry from our student photo contest this year. Uh, we had a French student that went to ITESO. I believe today and tomorrow are the last days to vote for our photo contest. So please log into Facebook on the Facebook page that Linda showed you earlier. And you can use that to vote in our photo contest. Please encourage your students to do the same. Universidad La Salle is our university that's located in Mexico City. It's located in Colonia Condesa, which is a really trendy neighborhood. It's 
uh, filled with lots of art. It is part of the larger De La Salle educational system. Students need to have four plus semesters of Spanish to go to this university. There are not classes in English. And it is in Mexico City, so I would recommend junior standing, but mature sophomores can apply. Um, again, there are some volunteer opportunities. Here we see the sign for the Universidad de la Salle Brigada Comunitaria, or Community Service Club. Um, and they're very strong in engineering. Here's a card that they built for a competition, Humanities, Business, and Law. Uh, the International Office has a very supportive uh, ISEP coordinator, a closed campus with excellent facilities. They even have a Starbucks on campus if your students really need their Starbucks caffeine fix. Um, but Mexican coffee is great, so, you know, venture out of your comfort zone. And moving on to our final university with, in Mexico, which is Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla, or UPAEP. Um, there are programs available for absolute beginners to advanced students. Courses available in English and Spanish as a second language. There is a pre-session language course and service learning available for credit. Um, we have a brand new program offered at UPAYA, which is called our pre-med program. Um, this is a three to four US credit program, which means that students will take this in addition to other courses at UPAYA. Uh, it consists of three elements, shadowing a local physician. They may even be in an operating room with this physician. Uh, four to ten medical lectures that they'll attend each semester, meetings with a supervised physician to go over any questions they may have. Uh, there is an additional fee to participate in the pre-med program, which is paid directly to UPIF. This year, I believe it was about $1,200 for the semester. Students do need to have an intermediate level of Spanish to participate in this program because they're going to be interacting with local patients and physicians. Right now, this program is only offered in the fall, um, but it may be expanded at a later date if there is demand to do so. OK, moving on to Nicaragua, which is my last country, and then I'm going to turn this over to Regina for the remainder of our webinar. We have one university in Managua, Universidad Americana. Um, this is a site where there are courses offered in English and in Spanish, but the majority of students taking English classes are local Nicaraguan students. Um, there isn't a very large international population uh, at this campus for exchange students. Most of the time, the only exchange students will be ISEP students. Uh, so your students here will really have the opportunity to integrate into local culture and um, get to know uh, Nicaraguan culture well. Um, as I mentioned before, courses are available in Spanish and in English. The ones in English are generally business administration and arts and sciences. There are some really interesting courses in international development and tourism development that are offered. UAM does follow the Southern Hemisphere calendar, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, there are host families. Um, like with most of our host families, uh, there was a question about this earlier. All of our host families are screened in advance by the local ISEP coordinator, and students will have the opportunity to fill out a questionnaire usually, or in certain cases, as Regina will talk about, play an active role in the selection of their host families. Uh, UAM is a small campus, about 2,000 students, small class size. There are four ISEP coordinators on this campus. So this is a good site for sophomores or students who need additional support. There are two academic coordinators and two logistical coordinators with really fun and unique excursions planned throughout the year, including volcano boarding, which is this lower picture, so students sledding down an active volcano. Um, and uh, a really supportive environment. Uh, our newest program, which is a summer program, which is offered on ISEP Direct. Oh, I did want to mention Universidad Americana is available on ISEP Exchange and ISEP Direct. So those of you who are direct members, your students are welcome to apply. Students can take courses in either language or both. I did want to clarify that point as well. Our newest Green Adventure program is only available on ISEP Direct and it is taught entirely in English. There is no language requirement for this program. Uh, the courses are going to be in ecology and environmental science with an optional pre-session language program that students can participate in. And this isn't going to be your typical classroom experience. Students are going to be out in the field every single day uh, collecting uh, water samples, doing tests for biology experiments, 
Um, in most cases, they're going to be staying overnight at field stations and biological reserves. And when they're in Managua, they'll be staying with a host family. So this is a new program that we're really excited about. Again, it's available on ICEF Direct. And if you have any questions about this program, please feel free to email me. The course descriptions and syllabi are available on our website. And we would really think this would be a great option for your environmental science students or anyone who's really interested in you know, getting to know Nicaragua better. At this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Regina for the remainder of our webinar. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat function. Okay, so moving on to Puerto Rico, I have two schools in Puerto Rico, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, in Puerto Rico, my schools in Puerto Rico are exchange only, so that's important to note. And here you'll see where I listed a few of the adventures that students can do on their own. Um, in Puerto Rico, as you guys know, it is a U.S. territory, so it's an easy option for U.S. citizens. You know, they don't have to bring their passport or their visa, um, so this could be a good fight for them. Um, at both my schools in Puerto Rico, they have excellent chances of placement on exchange. And another thing I'd like to point out about my schools in Puerto Rico is that most textbooks are in English, but classes are in Spanish. So therefore, students do have to have a minimum of four semesters of Spanish. That is very important. Uh, lastly, before I move on to the, each individual school, I also want to point out that the University of Puerto Rico at both of my sites have a mandatory health insurance. So students at this time have to purchase both the UPR health insurance in addition to the ISEF health insurance. Um, so they should keep that in mind when they're trying to budget for this. And we do have this listed on the directory pages, and I also list it in their PKF to make sure they know well in advance that they will have this additional cost. So here's a map of Puerto Rico, and you'll see where UPR Rio Piedras is right next to San Juan. Uh, UPR Mayagüez is on the western side of the island next to beautiful beaches, as is UPR Rio Piedras. Um, UPR Mayagüez, uh, they do have strong fields in sciences and engineering. Um, one thing that I'd like to highlight about Mayagüez is that it is a great option for STEM students. I feel like a lot of coordinators are often looking for uh, programs that are great for STEM students, and this would definitely be one of them. It is a bet accredited as well. And Mayagüez is also known for its excellent research facilities. Moving on to UPR Rio Piedras. Uh, they have a lot of different fields of studies available, but some of their strongest fields include literature, history, languages, business, and psychology. Um, they also will accept sophomores on a case-by-case -case basis, but some programs will not be open to them. Um, and I would, of course, recommend that the sophomores that you might nominate for a Rio Piedra, that they be mature and very independent. Um, the residence hall for UPR Rio Piedra, it is located a block away from the university, too. Okay, so we'll take a second here to pause and see if you guys have any questions about Central America and the Caribbean. So feel free to use that chat function to type in your questions. Okay, so I'll go ahead and move on, and then if you have questions, of course, feel free to type in your questions in the chat function. So going on to South America, we'll start off with Brazil. And again, you'll see where I just listed a few adventures that students can do on their own while they're in Brazil. Um, Brazil is a huge country, so of course there's a variety of things they can do. One thing about Brazil that I want to point out is that their visa process can be lengthy and complex, and students should start looking into the process as soon as they're placed. All students, uh, regardless of whether they're studying in Brazil for the semester, full year, or on their summer program, must obtain the student visa prior to going to Brazil. So that's very important to point out. Um, so here is a map of Brazil, or part of it anyway. And you'll see that our school, Fafi, is located in Sao Paulo. OK. Um, the exchange space at Fafi is fair. It's generally fair. Um, and then, of course, chances of placement on direct are excellent. They do have a couple different options available, and I have all the details in that outline that was given to you, so I'm just going to highlight a few here, but the regular program language requirements that I want to point out is that you either have to, student has to either have four semesters of Portuguese, or they can be an advanced Spanish student for the semester or four-year program. 
if they are an advanced Spanish student, then they would enroll in the pre-session Portuguese language course, um, which tuition is included in ISA benefits, but they would have to pay for their housing and meals. And once they finish the pre-session Portuguese course, then they can enroll in courses in Portuguese for that semester or full year. And then for the summer program, no prior Portuguese is required for that program. They also offer a direct language and culture program. And this is a great option for students who maybe don't have a Portuguese background or a Spanish background, but they really want to learn about the culture, history, literature, et cetera, of Brazil. Um, all courses are taught in Portuguese. And they have two different levels ranging from the beginner to intermediate. One thing I'd like to clarify, too, about FAPI is their housing options. You'll see in a lot of our, um, in a lot of our publications, it will say that it's a homestay option. But I want to clarify that in Brazil, oftentimes, homestay really means um, like a shared apartment. So it's not going to be a homestay where they're living with like a host mom, a host dad, maybe a host brother or sister. It's going to be them living with a Brazilian student and other international students. And the other option they have is living in a student house with other international students. Uh, coming soon, we are hoping to offer a direct program with all courses instructed in English. Um, the details are still being finalized, but hopefully we'll get that set soon so that we, we can start marketing it and offering it uh, very shortly. Uh, and lastly, before I move on to Argentina, I want to mention with FAPI, they do have different benefit uh, packages available. Students can either do tuition only or tuition, housing, and meals for the direct program. Um, I'd only recommend the tuition only option for students who either have family or friends in Sao Paulo. Finding your own housing in Sao Paulo can be a bit challenging. So again, I only recommend that option for those who have family members or friends in Sao Paulo that they know they want to stay with during their semester or full year program. OK, so moving on to Argentina again, here are just some examples of some adventures students can do on their own. Um, and Argentina, on exchange space, Argentina is very, very competitive. All sites are limited chances of placement, but all institutions do have direct options. So if a student has their mind set on going to Argentina, if they wanted to, they can list the exchange first and direct second to ensure that they can, you know, hopefully get spots at their preferred site. Uh, generally speaking, for my sites in Argentina, students do have to have an intermediate to advanced Spanish level. But there is a direct language and culture program at the Universidad del Salvador in Buenos Aires for those with an elementary level of Spanish. And I'll talk about more in this more in a second. I have two schools in Buenos Aires and two schools in Cordoba. So you might get students asking, well, what's the difference between Buenos Aires and Cordoba? Um, both are wonderful cities. They're both large cities. Buenos Aires, of course, is the largest city in Argentina with a population of 12 million. It's a bustling, bustling city with lots of things to do. Um, and it, it's great. There's always a lot of activities going on there. Cordoba is the second largest city in Argentina with a population of 1 million. Um, and with Cordoba, you do have that somewhat of a city feel. And then right outside of Cordoba, there, or right in Cordoba, there are mountains and lakes. There's plenty of outdoorsy things that students can do. So if you have a student who is either intimidated by going to a really large city, such as Buenos Aires, maybe Cordoba would be a better fit for them, or vice versa. If you have a student who loves big cities, you know, recommend Buenos Aires. It might be a good fit for them. Or if you have a student who's really outdoorsy, you know, Cordoba might be a good option for them. Um, another thing I want to mention before I move on to the institutions is the reciprocity fee in Argentina for US citizens entering Argentina. Um, you guys probably have heard about this before, but they did recently make a new change as of December 2012. US citizens entering into a visa or Jorge Newbery Airport must pay the fee online prior to arriving. This is a change in that in the past, students would just pay when they got to the airport. Um, but now they have to pay online before they go. I also recommend that students keep a lookout on the Embassy of Argentina's website, because they may expand this reciprocity fee to other airports throughout Argentina in the near future. Right now, it's only in effect for Adisa and Jorge Newbery. OK, so again, here's a map. I have my two schools in Cordula and my two schools in Buenos Aires. So our first school, Universidad del Salvador, is in Buenos Aires. Um, it has a regular program, both on exchange and direct. And it, it has a lot of great courses and a variety of different subjects. Um, and the thing I'd like to point out about Salvador is that they do have courses for international students as well. 
So this is a great option for students who maybe want to have a mix of classes with Argentine students as well as courses with only other international students. Um, I'd really recommend this this way they can get a feel for different types of, of courses and, and what that's going to be like. In addition to the regular program, Salvador also offers, offers a direct language and culture program for students with an elementary level of Spanish. This means that they should have no more than two to three semesters of Spanish. So they should have some Spanish under their belt, but they should not be at the intermediate level to take this program. All courses for this program are instructed in Spanish. Uh, moving on to our other university in Buenos Aires, the Universidad de Palermo. Uh, they have many fields of study, but it's particularly great for students studying art, design, communications, among other subjects. Um, I'd like to highlight that they do have a Latin American cultural identity program, which focuses on Latin American studies. Um, these classes are with other Argentine students. It's not a separate ICEP program. This is under the regular program. They just have this option available for those that are studying Latin American studies. Um, this might be a good option for them. Moving on to my schools in Córdoba. Uh, first, we'll go over Universidad Católica de Córdoba. Um, they, one thing in particular I wanted to point out about Córdoba is that they do have a volunteer opportunity for students. Um, in this volunteer opportunity, they get to work with the locals concerning issues about environmental conservation, social justice, education, human development, etc. So if you have a student who really wants to study abroad but also wants to do some sort of volunteer work, you know, you could recommend Cordova and um, they can speak with the ISAP coordinator upon arrival to get more information about uh, this volunteer program. Another thing about Cordova I'd like to clarify is that in Cordova students do live with host families, but they select their own host family. Uh, UCC does help with this process when they give them advice through their housing database, but the process might be a little different than other schools where the host family is selected for them. And lastly, we have Universidad de Pascal. And um, with this school, things I'd like to highlight for this school is that whereas my other schools require five semesters of Spanish, this school only requires four semesters of Spanish. So it is great for students with a lower language level. It's also great for students who are at the sophomore level or students who need more support. So I'd like to uh, let you guys know about that. Um, and students do live with a host family. They have buddy program available as well. Moving on to Chile, again, here are just some examples of some adventures students can do on their own when they go to Chile. Um, Chile is popular, and exchange-based can sometimes be competitive. My school at uh, Valparaiso, that has both exchange and prex options, and my schools, um, my two campuses for Universidad Católica del Norte are only exchange. Um, generally speaking, these schools are for students with the intermediate to advanced Spanish level. One thing I'd like to point out is that the Chilean student visa process is lengthy and complex and requires an FBI background check. Um, so I would recommend that you advise your students to apply for the FBI background check as soon as placed. They should not wait till they're confirmed. They should go ahead and apply for the FBI background check as soon as they see that they are placed at their host institution. Uh, coming soon, we do expect to uh, bring on a new exchange member in Santiago. Um, it looks like this exchange member will only be open to U.S. students, not eye to eye. Uh, so hopefully we'll have that available very soon. Uh, and here's a map for of Chile. You'll see where Valparaiso uh, is. Coquimbo is a little bit further north. It's known for its beautiful beaches. And further north is Antofagasta, um, which is known for their mix of beaches and mountains. So for Valparaiso, um, on exchange, it's a fair chance of placement, generally speaking, and on direct uh, chance of placement are excellent. In addition to their regular program, they also offer a direct language and culture program. This is for students who have maybe zero to two semesters of Spanish, and they want to take beginner Spanish courses plus two to three courses in English. So that'd be a great option for them. Also, they also offer a direct contemporary Latin American studies program for advanced Spanish students. This program is only available during our fall semester, which is their uh, spring semester, July through December. And it focuses on Latin American studies, and it's a mixture of taking courses with international students. They take three courses with only other international students and two courses with Chilean students, and six semesters of Spanish is required. Um, moving on, 
to Universidad Católica del Norte and Antofagasta. Um, first, I'd like to mention Universidad Católica del Norte. They have two campuses, one in Antofagasta and one in Coquimbo. Um, for Antofagasta, it's located in the northern part of Chile. And some strong fields include architecture, sciences, engineering, and on exchange, it has a generally good chance of placement, and this is not a direct option. Going on to Coquimbo, um, they are located in between Balfo and Antofagasta. They are port city. They're known for their beautiful beaches. And some of their strong fields include marine sciences, engineering, and business. And they also have a generally good chance of placement on exchange. No direct option is available. Moving on to Colombia. Again, here are just some examples of some things that students can do while they're in Colombia. Uh, Cali, the Universidad Isesi is located in Cali, which is the third largest city in Colombia. And fun fact, it is the salsa capital of the world. Um, for Universidad Isesi, it is also only an exchange option. We do not offer direct uh, programs there. And it has a generally good chance of placement on exchange. One thing I'd like to point out is that all undergraduate students must take the Spanish tutorial course. It's either at the intermediate or advanced level. It is non-credit bearing, but it's just a way for students to help get acclimated um, into taking classes in Colombia, and it's, it's good for them as well. I'd also like to point out that they do have internship opportunities, and so this might be available for a student who is interested in this. Uh, Cali is known, or Cali has many multinational organizations. We recently heard from one of our full year French students who's there, um, and he just finished his marketing internship, and he just absolutely loved it. So if you have a student who's interested in doing internships, I'd recommend they speak with the ISEP coordinator upon arrival to find out what type of internships might be available for them. Uh, lastly, they do have an MBA program that has courses in English and in Spanish. We're still waiting on the details for that, but um, hopefully more details will be coming very soon. And lastly, um, we have Uruguay. Um, again, here are just some examples of things that students can do on their own when they're in Uruguay. And here's my map. You'll see that UC, or UC Uruguay is in Montevideo. Okay, so in addition to taking regular courses, there are also some courses available for international students. So that, those tend to be very popular, and again, it's um, a great way for students to take both courses with international students and courses with Uruguayan students. They also offer a community service program where international students and Uruguayan students work with children or young people in impoverished areas. Students do receive a grade and credit hours for this course. Um, so just to reiterate, my, all of my sites have direct options with the exception of Colombia, Universidad Católica del Norte, both campuses in Chile, and my two schools in Puerto Rico. But other than that, all my uh, programs offer direct options. So at this point, we'll be responding to any more questions you may have. If they're really specific, we may contact you directly offline. But now is a good time for you to um, type in any questions you have. We really want to thank you for attending our first uh, series of webinars. Um, and we really do appreciate the fact that you took the time to learn a little bit more about the site today. So we have a site from our coordinators in Argentina. Um, hello, everyone. As regards to personal statement and academic references, if an Argentinian student is interested in studying in Spain, should he, she write her personal statement in English or Spanish? Um, no. Uh, Pablo, to answer your question, if they're going from one site to another, whether it's Spanish to Spanish, they only need to send a personal statement in Spanish. And the academic references can also be in Spanish. That's fine. Um, I do also want to point out any of your students who are interested, or any of your professors who prefer to write academic references in Spanish, if they're a Spanish faculty member, that's fine with us too. We read them in Spanish and then forward them on to our coordinators. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up? If you do think of other questions, please feel free to email Regina or I. We'll be happy to respond to you offline. Healy, I will look into the uh, possibility of graduate level Spanish translation um, at those schools in Monterey and get back to you. 
Additionally, if you'd like a copy of this uh, GoToMeeting sent to you, uh, please email me and let me know. Again, it is a large file. We may have to send it to you via Dropbox. Um, or if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, we're happy to provide that as well. Um, this is Linda. I just want to thank all of you for participating uh, in this webinar, and I especially want to uh, thank Hillary and Regina for putting all of this together and doing such a great job of summarizing this. Please, uh, like Hillary mentioned, follow up with us if you have any particular questions, and we look forward uh, to communicating with you in the future. Thank you. We will be sending out a very short evaluation so we can improve these in the future, so do look out in your inbox for that. With that said, we're going to go ahead and end our meeting. Thanks again, and please let us know if you do have any questions. Thank you.